Well, I've put a lot of work and a lot of wood into this bench, and it's time to turn my sights on the lower shelf. Um, I decided I do want to install the lower shelf. I've got some things that I want to keep near the bench, some things that I want to keep up off the floor, and um, figured it's not going to hurt. So I was digging through my lumber rack over in the corner and trying to pull out all of the various scraps and small pieces of ash that I've been accumulating since I started this bench over a year ago. Little pieces that I didn't know what I was going to do with, knew it wouldn't work for another part, so I just stuck it on the lumber rack. Ended up with a, you know, a lot of things like this, kind of in the three inch wide section, but all eight quarter lumber. So what can I do with these? How can I use this for the bench? Um, and I've got a lot of long, very long, skinny cutoffs when I was actually ripping the top pieces to length. And these I'm actually going to use for the ledger strips that the shelves will sit on. These are the two long ledger strips. Just using another piece of scrap, came up with the two end ledger strips. These will be just screwed onto the inside of the stretchers, flush with the bottom of the stretcher. And, you know, simple enough, the shelves will just set right down on top of them. The shelves will be tongue and grooved together, and what I'll do is just fasten the two end shelves in place, and everything else will be held in place through uh, tongue and groove. Might go in somewhere in the middle and, and put in a dowel joint or something just to kind of keep everything flat. But, um, really, it should be installed kind of temporarily. Uh, I don't think it's really going to be necessary to glue everything in place. So I've come back to the bench with all these scrap pieces and kind of assembled them all together to get a tongue and grooved shelf. And you know, I like the fact that they're all varying widths. And I think if you look at a lot of um, a lot of old furniture, if you look at the back of the furniture that wasn't meant to be seen, you see that ship lap or that tongue and groove back. And a lot of times the the panels are of totally different widths, and that's really because of this process. They took whatever scrap was lying around the shop, uh, you know, a, a cheaper secondary type wood, and used it to construct the back of the piece. Now, uh, you know, I'm gonna try to keep it all at the same species because it will be somewhat visible, and you know, I don't know that I really want to use a, a nice piece of cherry for the bottom shelf of my bench. So I do have uh, a couple of nice wide pieces. This is actually came out of the. Uh, the chop for the leg vise. This was resawn out of that big uh, 12 quarter stock. And uh, this wide piece actually was resawn from the chop for the sliding leg vise. So, you know, I've got some wider pieces in here interspersed in with some of these four and three inch wide pieces, I think will make for kind of an interesting shelf bottom. So, first thing I'm going to do is go through and measure out my widths of the shelf parts and go ahead and start cutting these pieces to an approximate length. Um, this is the, the, the length between the stretchers. It's actually just the tiniest bit long because I've done all this part by hand, rough this out with just hand saws. And I'll, I'll look to uh, trim it to final width so that it just drops into the space either at the table saw or the band saw. I might even just use a shooting board to do that. So these four pieces are already cut. Let me go ahead and mark the lengths on all these and start cutting them cross-cutting of the width, and um, I'll uh, bring it back when we're ready to uh, start cutting the tongue and groove. Uh, I'm sorry, rather, when it's time to start resawing some of these pieces. I'm going to try to conserve some of this eight-quarter stock by slicing it in half, and I'm making the shelf parts three-quarters of an inch thick. So in an earlier blog post this week, or last week rather, I wrote about my theory to abstain from the joiner and the table saw. So here I am at the saw bench cross-cutting all these shelf planks so they fit between the stretchers. Now I'm going to come over to the bench and resaw the eight-quarter stock. And you can see I'm having a little bit of trouble here as it slips in the vise. I don't have leather on the jaws yet. I didn't say I was abstaining from the band saw, so after resawing that first piece, knowing that I still had about nine more to go, I made it easy on myself and came over to the band saw to finish up the resaw. So now it's back to the bench. Working on the ledger strips here, these are um, rough stock. So I'm flattening one face here with the joiner plane. Then I flip it up on edge and I use my four plane with a cambered iron to square it to the face. Uh, that cambered iron really helps to bring the whole thing uh, in alignment. And then just come back and double check with a square. It's imperative that these be perfectly square to one another so the tongue and groove don't end up 
coopering the joint. Um, I took two long pieces that I had cut off way back in my first day of building this and milled them up to one inch square. And then I cut four pieces out that would act as ledger strips to go down here on the bottom of the bench. And if you look uh, right up here, you can see the, um, the footage of the strips. All I did was uh, drill some holes through, countersink, and then run um, two and a half inch screws in there to hold them in place. They are flush with the bottom of the stretchers. And the shelf parts are three quarters of an inch, which is going to give me a nice lip uh, between the shelf and, and the rail so that I can kind of hold things in place as I move the bench around and stuff like that. So now that I've got all these parts uh, milled up to three quarters of an inch, I've got them to the exact width that I need to slip perfectly into the space between the stretchers. Um, I just went around and, and kind of organized them randomly, if you will. So I've got random widths. I'm going to tongue and groove them all together and I may or may not put like a decorative bead or at least a chamfer between the tongue and groove joists to highlight it. I'll see what it looks like once I get it all together. But um, one thing I did was make sure that every piece is exactly the same thickness, everything is perfectly square and perfectly true, because uh, that's going to be really, really the key when it comes to making these tongue and groove joints, because I am going to make them by hand using this tongue and groove or match plane. Um, I have two of these. I have a vintage Stanley, I think it's a 78, 49, 48, I don't know. Um, it, it centers the tongue and groove on 7 eighths of an inch stock. And then um, actually a gift certificate that I got for Christmas, uh, I invested in this Lee Nielsen, which centers it on more common um, 3 quarter inch stock, which is what I use the most of. And, you know, I've had real problems with my vintage plane because it's got two irons that float inside of it. I've had real trouble keeping it square. There's there's a warp in the fence itself. So I figured I might as well step up to a modern day plane and that's what I've got here with this Lee Nielsen. So we'll go through um, how to use this and how to set it up. The biggest thing is to have stock that is true and square to one another or you'll get kind of a coopered effect if the edges aren't perfectly square. So now that I've determined everything is perfectly square and flat, I went in and organized everything and then numbered each joint. Um, this is the first tongue and groove joint. I've got one and one, two and two, three and three, etc., all the way down to my 14th joint. And that way that mark will allow me to have a reference point to make sure I'm referencing the fence of this plane against the right face every single time. Now, I went in and using just this folding rule, I've measured the spot between basically my available space on the bottom of the bench and I know this is the dimension I need I know that um, the each joint is a quarter inch joint so I'm taking a quarter inch off of one board, quarter inch off the other board so I've got about a half inch um, that's subtracted out so when you take 14 times a half you get 7 inches so I know that this distance from this distance to here is exactly what I need so this needs to be a surplus of seven inches or maybe just a little bit under to allow for the expansion. So um, I've got about nine inches here right now, so I'll need to do a little bit of trimming along the way to get it to be an exact fit. What I have already done though is cut the notches on the edges here. That this, these basically slip right into the edge of the bench like you're seeing right here. So that's really it. I'm going to get to work on the tongue and groove joints. I've got 14 of them to cut. So um, come along and uh, let's learn how this uh, tongue and groove plane works. So this is the Lee Nielsen number 48 tongue and groove plane. Uh, again, it's modeled after the Stanley number 48, which the original Stanley 48 centers on 7 eighths of an inch stock. In fact, Here is uh, a vintage Stanley number 48. You can see it is a um, it's an all metal body, um, cast all at once with some nice, pretty decorative effects. Um, you know the the gold paint on here, and it is paint. This is not a bronze plane. A lot of times when you get these vintage, it's nice to find one that's not terribly flecked off. Um, but again, this centers on a seventh eighths of an inch 
piece of stock. The groove is still, I believe they're identical. No, actually, I'm sorry. This groove is substantially thicker. In fact, this sets up a 3 eighths of an inch groove, um, whereas the Lee Nielsen does a quarter inch groove. So in some respects, it actually makes a um, little bit easier work because you're not removing quite so much wood. The principle of the moving fence is still the same. This uh, spring-loaded peg comes out and the fence spins to allow you to cut either um, the groove, in this case it's set up to cut the groove. Uh, you can see, hopefully you can see, only one iron is exposed right now. Let me do this. There's only one iron that is exposed for cutting. So this is actually cutting the groove, and as you continue to work that groove down into the board, this uh, sole will actually ride in that groove and register the joint. So once you swing the fence around, it exposes two cutters. You can see both cutters sticking out there, and now it's going to plow out these areas and it's going to create the tongue. It's the same principle on the Lee Nielsen plane. The uh, fence, you know, spins around, same spring-loaded mechanism, and uh, the same idea of cutting. The real big difference that, that I see, and especially so far in usage between these two planes, is the iron. Now, first of all, my um, stand here, it may look like it's in pretty good shape, but this fence is actually warped and bent, and I've got a huge pitted section right there in the middle as well, which is not a big deal, but the warp fence has caused some problems where the groove, um, and, and the tongue for that matter, tends to wander as you move down the board. The other huge difference, as I said, is the blade. Um, the vintage Stanley, these are two small irons, independent of one another, that move about, whereas in the Lee Nielsen, we have only one iron. And I'll unscrew the lever cap here. You can see it's one iron with this you know groove down the middle, so it looks kind of like a tuning fork. In fact, it works like a tuning fork too. Mm. Ba, that sounds. Uh, I think that's an A. If there are any people with perfect pitch listening to this, let me know what you think, but I think that's an A. <laughs> Useless information, I know. But you can see, with it being all one iron, you can keep these two blades at the same height, which is something I've really struggled with on the vintage plane and having to constantly adjust and keep it um, at the same height. And if they're not at the same height, your, your tongue will actually get um, not so much out of square, but it's not going to fit flush because one side's not going to be deep uh, as deep as the other. Now, the adjustment of this plane is extraordinarily simple. This center post where you see this screw is milled to the exact dimension, the interior diameter or interior width of this blade. So, as I slide it in place, there's no play at all there, none at all. So it keeps the blade square to the orientation of the plane body itself. There's no um, you know, lever adjustment or anything like that, um, like you would expect on, on a lot of planes. Um, this is just simple adjustment using a hammer to tap it in place. So you slide the uh, cup iron in place of it. And these planes are actually designed to take a pretty thick shaving. So I just use my plain mallet and that's how you depth deepen the cut. Now backing the cut out can be a little bit more difficult since there is no wheeled adjuster. It's just a matter of you know loosening it, pulling the thing out and kind of going up again, tapping the blade in until you've got it where you want it again. Um, and as we get into using the plane uh, you can see how I do that. Again, this is a plane that is designed to take a heavy cut, so I'm going to be looking at um, probably 16th of an inch shavings, maybe at, at most. That might be a little bit heavy. 
Um, I tend to start a little bit lighter when I'm starting the cut until I can get the groove or the tongue established, which will then guide the plane. Once I've got it firmly guiding and square to the face, then I'll deepen the cut and, and you know remove as much waste as I can as quickly as I can. The whole process really doesn't take that long to make uh, one half of a joint. And then um, flipping over to the groove is all, all the easier because you're removing even less wood with just a central groove down the middle. If you read the instructions that Lee Nielsen provides, they recommend cutting the tongue first, uh, working with both blades, and then moving over to cutting the groove. Um, that way, if your blade does dull in that first tongue, um, you know, you might get a little bit more tear out when cutting the groove, but that's not that big of a deal because the groove is completely invisible in the assembled joint. So, let's uh, get set up here on the bench top and I'll show you how it works in action. Okay, just a quick reminder when you're cutting this joint, uh, you want to go through and establish uh, a reference face. Just like with most hand work, you need to have a good reference face. In this instance, I've marked the reference face uh, and I've marked the joint number. If you remember, I have 14 boards. Uh, I've got a total of 13 joints to cut um, along each, between each board. And I've marked each side of the, of the same joint the same number. So this is the sixth joint. So I've got a six marked here and a six marked here so that I know the orientation of the boards. I've already cut the number five joint. You can see I've got the groove cut in. The other thing is, when you're uh, tongue and grooving an entire set of panels like this, you want to start at one end and work your way to the other end. That way you make sure you're not cutting a, a tongue and a tongue together and a groove and a groove together. It's just best to keep it organized that way. You could certainly go through and mark, you know, this is a tongue and this is a groove, etc., 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 but it's just really, you know, not, it's extra work that's not needed. So I'm working my way from left to right. Um, I've already cut this number five joint, so I'm going to cut the first half of the number six joint, and then we'll wrap it up with the second half of the number six joint so you can see how the whole thing comes together. You can use a face vise to hold your work here. Um, I'm using my in vise. Uh, it's, it's a little precarious on the taller boards like this one. This board is uh, about seven inches wide, so when I set it in the vise, you know, it's standing up on a long narrow edge. So it, it can wiggle a little bit, but ultimately um, until I get the groove set, um, I'm really, or actually, see, got to double check here. Um, am I cutting the groove or am I cutting the tongue? All right, I've already got the groove cut on this side, so I'm cutting the tongue now. Uh, remember, there's a groove and a tongue on each board. So before I make this mistake, let's turn the fence around so that it's set up to cut the tongue. So anyway, as you, as you get started, pay attention to where your reference face is. My reference face is over here. Let me move the camera in a little closer. Okay, my reference face is back here. The other thing you need to very, pay very close attention to is that this edge is square to your reference face. If it's not square, you're going to get joints, tongue and groove joints, that come together at like an angle. Now maybe I'm exaggerating, but hey, you may want it that way. Maybe you're putting tongue and groove kind of a cooper door together to do that. That could be very useful if this is not square. But we want a flat plane here, so make sure that this edge is square to your reference face. Now, the reference face is what your fence will ride against. The fence always rides on the reference face. If you mix it up, you may get a tongue and groove joint that is not flush when you're finally done. Now, there is not a left hand or a right hand version of this plane, um, so you may find yourself sometimes cutting against the grain. So the other thing you wanna look at, if it's really, really important that these, these, these joints may show a whole lot, the only part of the joint that's going to show is when you're actually cutting the tongue. 
and the shoulders below the tongue may show. So you don't want that to tear out a whole bunch. So if it is really, really important, pay attention to where your tongues will be and orient them in a way that you're gonna be working with the grain. I'm not terribly concerned about in this instance. Um, also, you can lighten your cut up a little bit to control things like tear out when you're working against the grain. Ultimately, it's not that big of a deal because this plane cuts pretty smoothly as long as you keep the iron sharp. Um, I have already sharpened this iron um, because of its weird shape. I went ahead and used a honing guide. Um, normally I do a lot of sharpening freehand, but um, it comes from the factory, I think at like a 30 degree angle. And uh, I went ahead and put uh, a micro bevel on it like I usually do on these planes, but a 35 degree angle. And uh, we're good to go. So in getting this started, any time, whether it's a plow plane or a tongue and groove plane, um, you want to make sure that you're keeping the joinery square. So rather than starting back here on this edge and working all the way across, if you, you know, come off your line or screw up halfway through the cut, you could possibly, you know, screw up the rest of the groove. So I start on the far end of the board and I work my way backwards. This is where you right-handed people are going to have a little bit of extra advantage over the lefties. As a right-handed person would be holding the toe with the right hand, using your left hand to hold the fence against the board. Eh, it doesn't work real well for me. I suppose I could flip the bench around um, and do it that way, but you know this is a left-handed bench, so it's not that big of a deal. I grab the toe with my left hand and I'll reach over the plane and kind of hold the fence, hold the fence over here to the board to make sure that I'm square. And simply. Take a shaving. Now, actually, I'm too light of a cut there. A little bit of a tap. Tighten that up. There we go. Again, I reach over the plane, or you know, if you if you're right-handed, just make sure you're pressing the fence against the reference face so that you keep it square. my way back just a little bit more. You can see I'm getting really good shavings here. I could probably deepen it up a little bit more once I get the, uh, the tongue established. See, down at this end of the board, I've already got the tongue pretty well established. Okay, that's the full length of the board. Let me be careful on a couple more starting cuts here. Nice and easy. Okay. Now I've got a good edge, maybe one more careful pass down here. All right, Let's see if I can get you a little bit closer here. See the tongue starting to form there. So when I bring the plane in, it actually kind of snaps down on there and the plane is firmly registered on the edge of the board right now. So, you know, once you get to that point, it kind of becomes a little, I don't know, meditative. <laughs> because the, the plane is riding in the, in, the, in the track, kind of on autopilot. And that's when you can bring your hand back up onto the knob and focus on... Uh, just plowing through it rather than being perfectly square. You can see these shavings are, are really heavy. You can probably even hear that in the pitch of the plane as it moves across. These shavings are a heavy 30 second, um, maybe 364ths, not quite a 16th, so I probably could go a little bit deeper. 
Um, I'm going to keep the adjustment where it is right now only because this board is pretty wide and you can see it wobbles a little bit. So uh, if I make it any deeper, I'm going to have to push even harder and I have the potential of screwing up my joint here. So. Again, make sure when you bring it back to start over, make sure it, did you hear that? That pops down into the joint and registers at the joint. This is a lot more work because this board is so tall. And basically planing just below sternum height. So it's all up the body at this point. Because of the way we backed down the board to establish the tongue, I'm going to reach finished depth at this end first. In fact, I'm already there. This plane right now, because it's relatively new, when it bottoms out, it's actually leaving, let's see, oh, too close. I don't know if you can see that. Let me take a couple more passes. It's actually leaving a dark mark on the wood right there, which tells me that I'm actually bottoming out and you can actually see it right there. It's bottomed out. So I'll just keep working my way down. You're done when it stops cutting. Halfway. Nope, more than halfway. This end of the board is always, the far end of the board is always tough because you don't have much of the plane supported at this point. Here. Only this very front part of the plane is supported, so it's, it's back heavy and you have to be careful when you're getting started so you don't dig below your line. So I tend to put, you know, a lot of weight on the front to keep it that way, but what ends up happening is I go almost a little shallow and it takes a little bit more effort to get this final section planed to depth. But, <laughs> all right, that doesn't look like very much effort because I'm done, I'm to depth. Notice, no cutting. It just moves smoothly across. And if you look, you can see those uh, dark marks I was talking about left by the plane. Now that's probably gonna go away with time and that's probably also a factor of me not uh, removing all of the factory packing. Um, I think they, they use lacquer on their planes when they come to the factory to prevent rust. I usually wipe down new planes with mineral spirits and because of the way this sole is set with this groove, I don't think I got into that groove all the way. So that'll go away after time. I'm not terribly worried about it. Now the other thing you might see here, let's come in closer. See this feathered edge here? And that is an indication that my board is just the slightest bit heavy of three quarters of an inch. It didn't remove the entire thing, which goes to tell you, you don't have to use a three quarter inch board. This just centers the tongue and groove on a three quarter inch board. If I were to use my vintage Stanley, it would still work just fine. It's just my groove would be off center, which, you know, not a huge deal, unless it's ridiculously off center and then your joint becomes not that strong. Um, as I understand it, Lee Nielsen is going to be releasing uh, a replica or a, their version of the Stanley 49, which is centered on a half inch board, which could be really, really helpful for tongue and groove cabinet backs and things like that, where you're, you're generally working with thinner stock. In this instance, I'm just going to kind of peel this off because it's so thin. And uh, if you want to be really picky, come in here with a paring chisel, reference it along the side. Uh, 
I'm always of the mindset that if you have the tools, use them. And I've got this really cool pairing chisel from Blue Spruce Toolworks. So, all cleaned up. So the tongue here is ready to go. And there were a couple of areas where I was actually cutting against the grain. But for the most part, I was lucky here and I was cutting with the grain, which is always helpful when you're cutting the tongue since you're removing twice as much wood. So, let's set this board aside. It's got a groove on one end and a tongue on the other. We'll grab the next board in the line. And again, double check. This is my number six. This is also my number six joint. I'm referencing the fence against the face. So I put the, the, the reference face this way so the fence will reference against it, tighten into the bench. Now this is really much easier to work with because the board's a lot narrower and it's not gonna wobble quite so much. So, whoops, see I almost did it. Flip the fence to move to the groove setting. holding the fence firmly against the reference face, start working my way back. Now here's an instance where I am working against the grain. So I'm going to get a kind of a messy cut at first. Take it slow, take small bites. I suppose if I really wanted, I could back the blade out a little bit, make it a little bit easier to start. Now the grain actually switches here at the end, and I'm back with the grain. The boards for this shelf are if you remember, they are the boards that were not good enough, not clear and straight enough to go into the bench top. So they have kind of swirly grain all over the place. So the grain's going to change direction several times. No big deal. Okay, we've established the groove. A few more careful passes on this end just to make sure that I'm registered. All right. Now let's uh, hog it out. I'm going to back the camera off a little bit. In an effort to show you a little bit of planing technique. I think for an operation like this, I would probably move my bench out and go lengthwise across the shop because I'm backed up against this counter here, but uh, no big deal. When you're taking a big thick shaving like this, I will bring the fence up, kind of come at the edge of the board with a little jerk of speed to draw that shaving up. I make sure I'm registered in the board, and then you've probably seen Chris Shorts do this. It's a matter of kind of stepping forward and throwing your weight into it. That way you're not you know, entirely up your body, entirely arms. You're actually just using your weight. So it's just stepping in the direction you're planing. Depth on the far end. Whoops. There. Still going against the grain. A little bit harder here. This we're going to be a highly visible cabinet back or a door. I would probably really lighten up my cut here so that I'm not getting having to fight so hard to go against the grain. Okay, I'm almost there. A couple more at this very near end. Okay. And we're cutting 
our groove is to depth. So, let's take a look at this groove since we had to cut it against the grain. You may be thinking that's not a good thing, but this face right here, this is my original face. I didn't cut this. So that's still smooth as when I smoothed it with the grain before. If you look down in the groove, you can see, you know, there's tear out in there because I was plowing against the grain, but this is hidden inside the joint. All right, let's test the fit. Clear all the shavings out of the way. If you listen to Wood Talk Online the other night, hearing me say something random about it makes really cool shavings and you can use them as packing for gifts. And it works great. These are big, uh, you know, kind of curly cue shavings. And say you make a, you know, a wine bottle stopper or you make even a pen, something like that. You can actually put these in a gift box and set it on top of it. it makes a really, really nice, nice gift, good impression. And you're using up your shavings. Um, it's actually, can you see that outside? It's actually snowing right now. I've got about four inches of snow. So these shavings, they're going in the fireplace. They start fires really, really well. So we match up my number six joint mark with my number six joint mark. And beautiful, smooth fit. And uh, that's it, really. Um, I have a, let's see if you can make that out on the camera. Got a perfectly flush joint right here. Um, it's nice and firm. It's not sliding back and forth. But what I can do is it gives me room, some expansion room here, riding on that tongue and groove. After quite the marathon of tonguing and grooving, we have the entire lower shelf is done. Now um, there is a, a section, you can see the gap right here um, in the shot. Slightest little gap there, and, and that's basically because I need to spread out the boards to allow for the expansion gap. Still haven't decided whether or not I'm gonna put the chamfers, uh, the decorative chamfers in between the joints. I'll see what it looks like once I add in the expansion gaps. Just a reminder, this is winter, so these boards are the narrowest they're gonna be, so they're only gonna expand. So I don't wanna put them in there really tight and flush to one another, or I'm gonna have trouble, and have probably the shelf boards buckling on me come the humid summer months. So right now, um, I actually, I, I did make a mistake in my measurings. For some reason, I thought to allocate an inch per joint, and really it's only a quarter of an inch per joint because the, the groove is a quarter of an inch into the board. So I was way over on my um, allocated stop, which means I had uh, two boards that were actually extra that, you know, I just put them in the scrap pile and use them for later. What I ended up with though was a gap that was about two inches wide. It was too wide to be able to take it up, to be taken out by the expansion joints. So I had to end up ripping a board down to, uh, I think I went with about one inch wide. Um, so on the very end over on um, this part here, the, the gap that you see down in there um, is the one inch wide board. And I'm going to space everything out and kind of double check to make sure that I've got enough room for expansion. Good news is, is that a lot of the boards down here are pretty narrow in width, um, and I don't think they're gonna expand really that much. Um, there is a, an eight inch, there's two, yeah, two eight inch wide boards that were resawn off my, um, my chop, my, my leg vise chop when I originally did that, and those are obviously gonna move quite a bit on me. So now that the tonguing and grooving is done, it's gonna put this plane away. And I always wipe everything down um, with a little bit of oil. Uh, this is the rag I've been using for several years now. But the reason I wanted to kind of bring your attention to this is the way this plane is set up. With the iron, the way it is with this fork, you wanna make sure that you really clean on these inside faces because you'll get all kinds of sawdust in there and that's gonna breed rust really, really quickly. So make sure you've got down on either sides of the bed and have run the, the oily rag through the inside of this 
forked blade just to make sure that you've got everything out there and it's well lubricated and you're not going to, you know, pull this plane out of your cabinet in a couple of, uh, couple of weeks, months, or whatever and have it re-rust all over the blade. Uh, same thing goes with the sole. Uh, because of this grooved sole, you want to make sure that you get down inside there. And, you know, we're not scrubbing by any means, but it's just an area where sawdust is going to collect. Sawdust, like, you know, sawdust is wood. Wood is hydroscopic. So it's going to attract moisture from the air, suck it in, and it can cause rust very, very quickly. So wipe it down, and it's ready to go. Um up on the shelf except that it's not going on the shelf because I haven't built my tool cabinet yet so it's gonna I actually am gonna keep this in the box it came in for a while until I can get my cabinet built so let's uh, let's take a little bit closer look down here uh, at how we're gonna space everything out and um, how I'm going to secure it in place so that's it the shelf is installed um, all I really did was come in and I spaced out all the tongue and groove joints so that there was even uh, gaps so that the boards can expand on either side of the joint. And then I just went in and, and um, kind of re, not reinforced, but um, installed everything, if you will, using those stepped Miller dowels. No glue, just put them in, in uh, on the edges of the boards, in the center of the boards, to just kind of hold them in place so they don't flap around. Um, not that that's really going to happen because it's a really good fit down here, but now the shelf's all good to go, and um, I can finally stop running from one side of the shop to the other to grab things like shooting boards and bench hooks and all that stuff. So now it's on to the sliding leg vise.